Good morning. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> so, good morning and welcome to Middlebrook Heights Community United Church of Christ. We are so glad you are here. No matter where you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome. Special cry out to any, a special call, shout out to any guests or visitors or those returning after some time away. And welcome to our Zoom friends. Please type your prayer concerns in the chat. We'll get to those later. We are celebrating the success of the teeter-totter marathon of last week. The goal of $10,000 was exceeded. The current total is 11,141, but we're still collecting. We're not done yet. The Give Butter site, the donation site, will be open until March 31st. So please tell your friends, share it on Facebook, and if you haven't donated yet, you still have a chance. We are very thankful to the many hearts and hands and bodies that helped with this event. If you were, were with us last weekend, you saw just a flurry of activity both inside and outside the church. Even though it was chilly and windy and rainy, it was time well spent. Our after worship fellowship will be returning, but we need volunteers to make this possible. So help is needed before worship to prepare to set up and then after worship to clean up and, and get the dishwasher going. Instructions will be provided, so no, there'll be some on-the-job training. Uh, you need to sign up with the good news or there's a link outside the office at the connections point. We are also in need of hosts for our online after worship fellowship time. Uh, those on Zoom really enjoy this little bit of time after worship to connect, but we need somebody that we can transfer hosts to on Zoom who can sort of just be in charge of letting people in or just maintaining the session, understanding that when you leave, everyone leaves. You'll be closing it out. We are now members of Greater Cleveland Congregation. Thank you very much, and I want to ask you to save the date of April 7th. April 7th will be what they call an action, and in this session, they will be posing questions about specific issues uh, facing the residents of our community. They'll be uh, talking to the candidates for juvenile court judge and also the executive of the, um, the county council. Of the specific importance is the issue of the disparity of young men of color being turned over and tried as adults and also maintaining the success of the Mental Health Diversion Center. Those only are two of many issues that they'll be, they'll be bringing forward, allowing the candidates to respond. The reason we want so many people in, in attendance, in audience, both on Zoom and in person, is to be able to hold these candidates accountable, whoever gets elected, to be able to hold them accountable in the coming years. There is a Zoom link that will be posted in the Good News next week, or if you want it early, just give me a call, give me a shout, give me an email, I'll send it to you. Our Lent, as, our, we, as we continue our Lenten journey, I hope I want to remind you of the spiritual deepening sessions, which can be attended either in person or on Zoom every Thursday. All are welcome. And our Lenten prayer chains, how many are participating in Lenten prayer chains? It's a wonderful practice, isn't it? Oh, I love this. It's a powerful way to expand and deepen our relationship with God. We're inviting each of you to pray each day for a member of this congregation whose name appears on one of the, the chain links. Those who are participating in this practice, we ask that you return them during Holy Week and we'll decorate the church and you can see all the people that have been prayed for. How joyful. Blessing bowls, another practice for Lent. Participants, yes, yes. I have found this very enriching, um, becoming more mindful of the many blessings in our lives. You can create a bowl of your own. You can pick one up from the table in the parlor. Each day or each week during Lent, you're asked to reflect on the way ways that God has blessed your life and there are so many some days I have several it's um, to, to be mindful of it just helps you with your relationship with God recognizing the richness 
and the joy that is in our faith. So Palm Sunday, we're asking you to bring your bowls to worship, all those little blessings you've written down, and we're going to dump them in a collective bowl, and we're going to see our blessings for this whole congregation. Some announcements about Holy Week. Full to the brim and chances to expand our faith as Holy Week approaches. There's many opportunities to, to share as we continue our Full to the Brim series and experience God's abundant grace. All of the services are available both in person and on Zoom. So Palm Sunday, we'll begin our, our Holy Week tradition, waving palms in celebration. On Holy Week, on uh, Palm Sunday, we want to ask, what can't be silenced? What must be said? And what things can we not stay quiet about? As we go deeper into this story, the truth will soon be set free. We move along to Maundy Thursday on April 14th. Our Lenten journey draws to a close. We'll focus on Jesus' dark journey in his final days. We'll have an evening of fel in starting in the fellowship hall at 7, sharing of food and wisdom and sharing of our journey through Lent. And then at 7.30, our service will begin with some dramatic presentations. Good Friday is April 15th. We will gather in the sanctuary in fading light with some candles, a simple service of prayers and songs. I hope you will join us for any and all of those services in Holy Week. It has been an amazing Lenten journey. It is not over yet, and I am just fully, fully delighted to be on this journey with all of you. Our service of worship continues this morning and is indeed full to the brim. In the name of God, the Creator, the Redeemer and Sustainer, let us join now in worship. parable of the prodigal son will touch many with its familiarity. The name prodigal in this story refers to the son who squandered his inheritance. We often use it to describe someone who has returned to the fold after some questionable living. But the word prodigal actually means extravagant and lavish and perhaps wasteful. This parable invites us to consider how God's grace is also prodigal, generous, abundant, even illogical. The parable disrupts and expands our understanding of grace. Who deserves God's grace? Grace is not something we earn. After wasting his resources, the younger son returned home to his father who welcomes him with a celebration. The older son, who has followed the rules conformed to the family roles, checked all the boxes, is resentful of this celebration. Who are we in this story? 
This parable causes us to pause and think how we receive and how we extend God's prodigal grace. Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. God's reach is endless. God's mercy is unstoppable. God's grace is God's love is constant. God's wisdom is vast. God's hope is stubborn. God's present is here with us, among us moving through us. Breathe easy, breathe deeply. We are in God's house. Let us worship the one who welcomes us home. Please remain standing for the opening hymn, the Black Hymnal, number 23.
please be seated. Join me in the prayer of confession. I bet we can all remember a night when, as teenagers, we were late for curfew. You arrive home to find your parents standing at the door. The porch light is on. They tell you they can't sleep until they know you are home safe. Friends, I think God is like that for us. The porch light is on. The door is unlocked. We might be late for curfew, but God is just so glad we're home. So let us pray the prayer of confession together, trusting that no matter what we do or what we leave undone, the porch light is always on. Let us pray. The prodigal son isn't given a name, but we know his name. It sounds like ours. And we know his story. It sounds like ours. Who among us hasn't burned a bridge? Who hasn't forgotten? that we belong to one another, who has not ached for home. The prodigal son isn't given a name, but we know his name. Forgive us, God. We want to come home. Hear these words of forgiveness. The word prodigal can be defined as wasteful or imprudent, hence the name prodigal son. However, prodigal can also be described as extravagant and excessive, Friends, we worship a prodigal God, a God who is extravagant in mercy and excessive in grace. For no matter how many times we run, no matter how far we go or how lost we get, God is standing at the end of the driveway waiting for us. The doors are open. The feast is for you. The grace is extravagant. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of open doors, we long to come home to you, but we aren't always sure how to get there. We know that we need you, but the road back to you is heavy with distractions. So if we can dare to be so forward, we pray, reach into the cacophony of our hearts and minds and make yourself known. Quiet everything but your word for us today. Leave us awestruck. Drown out the distractions. Come as thunder or come as a still small voice. We don't care which. We just pray that you will come. Turn on the light. Speak through these words. Find the parts of us that are as lost as with hope we pray. Amen. The epistle reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. In our epistle reading this morning, Paul brings attention to the tension between the old and the new. God is spirit Paul is spiritful and knows the risen Christ and wants all to hear this message. He speaks of new creation, a new way of being in the world with Christ. It is exciting. It is not about the old traditions and rules. He is leading the new communities into a new life of reconciliation and transformation. And while these words of new life and change may sound exciting to many, we have to consider how these words may have challenged those traditionalists. How might you receive these words of new life and change yourself? Hear these words from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made us to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God is still speaking. The gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3 and 11 through 32. The gospel reading today is the familiar story of the prodigal son. This parable is one of three parables that Jesus tells in response to some criticisms from the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the uh, rule followers and consorting with sinners was not to be done. Jesus, of course, has already made it clear that he was here not for those who are already healthy, but for the sick, the wounded, the broken, the sinners. So, of course, we would be interacting with all these people. The first two parables have to do with what was lost is now found. And we often assume that the prodigal son parable is a continuation of that theme. But actually, this parable offers a different response to the Pharisees, one that shows the boundless extravagant and lavish grace of God, which is unearned and available to all. Hear these words of the gospel. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided this, his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and he put his arms around him and he kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quick, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called out to one of the slaves and asked what was going on. The slave replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, 
For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes? You killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, and he has been found. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, my words and my thoughts inspired by you, may they resonate and renew relationship with you and create a new way of being in this your creation. Amen. I find it comforting to hear familiar scripture in worship kind of like an old friend being visited after some time away. And the parable of the prodigal son is one of those texts. We hear the tale of two sons, one who's wandered off, abandoned family and responsibilities, squandered his inheritance, and the elder son who remains loyal to family and traditions. And when we hear the word prodigal, we always think of the one who returns after wandering away. But as we have heard, prodigal actually means extravagant, and reckless, and wasteful. So as, as we examine this story today, I'd like to take some time and perhaps consider a new lens, a lens that illuminates God's radical grace. And perhaps by the end, you might consider renaming this story. So first, a bit of context. The parable of the prodigal son is the third of three parables that Jesus shares after the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling about him consorting with the tax collectors and sinners. We know how Jesus was. He talked with anyone. He ate with anyone. And this really rankled the Pharisees. It was against the rules. So the first two stories of this triad, finding the lost sheep and finding the lost coin, speaks to the joy in finding what was lost. And in the prodigal son parable, yes, yes, there's joy in reunion, but we've often associated the story with sin and forgiveness and repentance. But sin and forgiveness are really not part of the story. The focus is on extravagance. The extravagance of the younger son, but even more, the extravagance of the father who joyfully celebrates the return of the son without question, without missing a beat, and just starts planning the party, and an extravagant one at that. And now let us remember that this story follows the grumbling Pharisees. So what message is Jesus sending to the Pharisees by telling this story? It's not really a response to their specific criticism of engaging with sinners, right? But it's a story about God's extravagant grace, radical grace, free-flowing, unearned grace that was perhaps kind of threatening to those Pharisees who believed that they had the lock on the rules and the commandments and the power and the authority and, yes, even sin. Jesus was telling the Pharisees in this story there is no accounting for God's grace. No one can determine who is worthy by God's standards. So let's look at the cast of characters in this story. And then you might consider who you relate to. So the younger son. We know he asked for his inheritance early, which some regard as disrespectful. And some may wonder, what if the family needed that money before the father dies? Wasn't that selfish or wasn't that greedy? And yeah, perhaps. But scholars have said that this was really not an unheard of practice in those times. It wasn't common, but it wasn't unheard of. 
You might imagine where modern day wanderings might have taken this younger son, perhaps to Vegas, or getting involved in some risky investment schemes, or some strange business startups. He had no safety net. His inheritance was all that he had. He'd left behind home and land and shelter and family, but he was probably one of those types that just could not even imagine failure. He had this soaring, unrealistic confidence, and he probably trusted the wrong people. He probably took advice or was influenced by those who saw him as an easy mark, inexperienced, vulnerable. And maybe you've never taken risks or colored outside the lines, but I'm sure we all know someone who has. I know I've had many times repeated the line, there but for the grace of God go I, recognizing there were times in my life that I was living without a net. So if you had to regroup after a failure, how were you received? Did someone say, told you so? Because that is a very human response, right? Or did you have to dig your own way out? Imagine if this son didn't have a family to return to. Or did someone open their arms and invite you in as you found your way to start again? That is what grace is like. Then there is that elder son. I think Jesus wanted the Pharisees to see themselves in this son, following tradition, rules, continuing with tiresome chores of life, even if there was no joy to be found there. Maintaining the way of life, not by choice, but by expectation and tradition. It was the way it had always been. And maybe you see yourself as that son, the traditionalist, the conformer, playing it safe. Fred Craddock mentions that church folk often, too often, fall into the trap of identifying too closely with that elder son, believing his love of family and tradition were honorable above all else. We can commiserate with his unwillingness to change. We often feel sorry for that son. We get it that he's resentful, right? Because we tend to create our own standards of fairness. And then we expect God to dispense grace accordingly. And the elder son just could not find his younger brother deserving of the father's grace. The older son could only count all the rules that had been broken. He could only see all the days he toiled while the younger brother lived large, or so he assumed. He was filled with resentment, and resentment leads to alienation. He could only cast aspersions, much like the Pharisees with Jesus. And as the elder brother's resentment grew, he withdrew. He distanced himself from the Father. He separated himself from the love that was so freely given to him by a father who dispensed grace in a radical way. As we consider the older son and reflect on characteristics that we might share, we struggle with that idea that even the most serious of sinners might receive God's grace. We impose our own standards of justice and fairness, and we want to believe that God doles out grace accordingly. But in this parable, Jesus is calling us to reassess our own standards, to reassess our relationship with God, and to acknowledge that God's radical grace is unlike anything humans can express. So let's take a look at the Father. Because truly, it's the father who holds the key to this story. We don't think about the father much when we hear about the prodigal son. So first, when approached by the son to get his inheritance early, the father gives it, without question. There was no lecture, there was no hesitation, he didn't ask for a justification. Some might say the father was reckless in this regard, giving without conditions, similar to loving without boundaries. If you remember, one of the definitions of prodigal was reckless. So was the father prodigal? Yeah. So let's keep going. You probably see where this is leading, right? The wandering, squandering son comes home. I'm guessing some time has passed and there was no check-in, there were no texts, there was no contact. 
and the son was pretty haggard by this time after working in the pig farms. And what does the father do? Does he tell him he smells bad and needs a bath? Does he ask where he has been? Does he ask what he did with all his money? No. He runs. He runs with his arms open. No expectations of contrition. He just holds him. And then calls for a party. An extravagant party. So is this what God's grace looks like? Lavish, illogical, unearned, and yes, prodigal. Perhaps we might think a better title is the prodigal father. In my own family, I'm waiting for reconciliation. I have a nephew who mysteriously ghosted the rest of the family. Me, his father who is ill, his sister and her family. As far as we know, there was no episode or incident that might have caused some hurt feelings. But even if that was the case, there's been no effort to talk, to connect, to unburden whatever grudges he might hold. Efforts to contact have been have had no response. It's been seven years since we last heard from him. I often wonder how I would receive him if he walked through those doors right now. Would I be the elder son, resentful and angry and admonishing? No, I don't think so. And while I am angry and hurt and confused, I know that certainly if he walked in right now, I would be running. I would be running with my arms open. I understand what was going on with that father in the story. He was just so happy to see his son. Unlike the finding of the lost sheep and the finding of the lost coin, this story requires us to return, to reunite. It requires us to receive, to come. And the father is acknowledging with gratitude the courage it took for the son to return. And the reward is grace, extravagant and radical. Some years ago at a different church, the youth were asked to share their understanding of various constructs of faith. They were videotaped as they answered, and this was played during church. One of the terms was grace. And in what I remember about their definitions, it had a lot to do with forgiveness. And yes, love. But what was missing was that unconditional acceptance that repentance was not part of the formula. What was missing was the unearned, that it's free and available to anyone. And what was missing was the extravagance, the overflowing acceptance that we as, as humans just can't even begin to understand. We all tend to try to fit things in nice tidy boxes of our own experiences. But God's grace just falls way outside our understanding and I am so glad it does. So back to the story. How did you consider this reunion? Were you uncomfortable with this radical expression of unconditional love by the Father? Was there some tension because you were also aligning a bit with that older brother? Well, there's supposed to be a bit of tension. We're supposed to see the contrast as we put ourselves in this story. We're supposed to feel that this type of grace is beyond what we might consider reasonable. But that was Jesus' point. As Paul wrote in the letter to the Corinthians, a life in Christ is about a new creation. Everything old has passed away, even how we understand God. We can be reborn. We can start over. Jesus has given us this ministry of reconciliation. And I think Jesus understood that this is not an easy transition for us, since many of us still harbor those influences like the Pharisees. Many of us still hold to the standards of resentment like the older brother. But Jesus wants us to hear very clearly that even when our lives are 
full and big and messy and complicated and imperfect and even sometimes a train wreck by our own standards, God's grace is still there. God's cup is so full that there is more than enough grace to go around. We don't need to be selfish. We don't need to decide who is worthy. God's grace doesn't prevent us from making bad choices, but when we do, because we are human, God's grace is still there. So each week in worship, we celebrate the return of the prodigals. Any of us, all of us. So let us join with each other in this expression of extravagant welcome and love. God's grace is full to the brim. It is lavish, illogical, and yes, prodigal. All we need to do is receive. All we need to do is fall into God's arms that are wide open. It's really that simple. Amen. Join me in the statement of faith. We believe in a God who waits in the driveway for us, who leaves the porch light on and throws a feast when we are found. We believe in a God who doesn't stop looking for us when we get lost. We believe in a God of prodigal grace, excessive, extravagant, <clears throat> over-the-top grace, and in response to his grace, we hold tighter to each other. We remember that humans are not meant to go through life alone, so we look for ways to welcome each other in, to live like we are family, to lead with grace, excessive, extravagant, over-the-top grace. We believe that this is our call. Let, Let it be so. so. Amen.
Thank you, musicians. Moving as always. I'd like to entertain joys and concerns. Um, I have a list here, but first, are there any from our congregation, any joys and concerns to share? Andrea. Andrea offers her thanks and praise for the teeter-totter marathon and all the joy that was shared and all the commitment and the energy that was put into it in spite of the weather and says that even if it was this weekend with the snow, we still would have been there. We still would have been teeter-tottering and working on the street and uh, people liked when I said that last week, work in the street. They thought it was pretty funny. So, <laughs> so I'm still saying it now. <laughs> And Wes was the best one working the street, let me tell you. <laughs> Any other joys, concerns? Yeah, Pat. What was the last name? Any others? Yeah. Oh, Laura. Yes, thank you. Any others? Tom. Debbie. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I need to back up with, for Zoom. Um, Tom Casterline asked for friend, prayers for his friend Chris, who suffered a stroke. Laura Toth um, is asking for prayers for um, her friend, her, was it granddaughter? granddaughter. The grandmother, um, Clara Ross, who died. And um, Pat spoke of a former member, Walter Berkey, who died um, a couple weeks ago. Any others? Vicki. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Vicki is celebrating the birth of her great niece, Emily. <laughs> Any others? And I'm looking at the chat. Unless I'm missing anything, I'm not seeing anything on the chat. Is my chat frozen? Just checking, Tom. Do you see anything else? Okay. It's just unusual not to see you guys uh, timing in on the chat. I'd also like to add um, a few other prayer concerns. Connie Lewis's sister Elizabeth is hospitalized and has been hospitalized for two weeks at Metro after a fall in her home. She suffered a brain injury and has been unresponsive this entire time. So our prayers go to both Connie and Bob in their uh, sitting bedside. John Nagemba continued prayers for John as he endures this aggressive chemotherapy for his aggressive cancer, and he's battling infections, currently in the hospital with pneumonia. Pray for John and his family as they travel this road of medical treatment. 
Continued prayers for Gus Freilich as he remains in long-term acute care and for his family. Randy Over's mom is improving, thanks for prayers, and has returned to her apartment. Has some assistance there, but she's doing much better. And Jan Henninger reports that her procedures of this past week went well, and she's doing well. But continued prayers for her, Dale, and their daughter Beth, who is offering care. And continued prayers for Courtney Simon, granddaughter of the Ivancix, who's being treated for celiac disease. Let us now be in an attitude of prayer as we lift to God these concerns, these joys, those named and those unnamed that we hold in our heart. Settle into silence as we listen for God. Holy God of radical grace, we are witnesses and recipients to your extravagant love, yet we still want to have a say about who is worthy. We are all made in your divine image, yet we often impose our own standards of who should receive your grace. Help us, God, to receive, to not judge, to lead, not exclude, to welcome and not withhold. In this season of Lent, we journey on this path that leads us closer to you. And in this journey, we are constantly amazed at your presence, your grace, and the many blessings you offer. Help us, dear God, to live into your call, to be more like you, to share grace without conditions, to offer blessings without considering worthiness. Help us to get out of our own way as we move closer to the cross on this journey of Lent. And as we move closer to the cross, we are reminded of the connection we have to one another in community and in faith. We don't walk alone and are ever thankful for the compassion and fellowship that is shared in this space. Your spirit is ever present and guides us to love, to share, and to serve. We know that to experience your grace, all we need to do is receive. Help us to move to that space of vulnerability, to allow you in, to accept all the love you have to offer without conditions. We lift up the people in this world who are victims of war and genocide and systems that oppress. The stories and the scenes are terrifying and we want to retreat and hide. But we know we cannot be silent. We know we must speak and act and be involved in making this a better place, a better world. We are called to follow. Grant us the wisdom and the courage to help in these struggles. As we move closer to this day of resurrection, grant us the courage to be part of this new creation. Help us to see the what's next and the what else in our lives. That way we may live more fully into your call. Help us to take those necessary risks. Keep us from being that elder brother who was resentful and stuck in his one way of living. We know there is more, that we may be open to your guidance to discern what that might be. And as we continue in prayer, we offer these words that Jesus taught by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, we have a stewardship moment. Ben Keller, who is husband of Debbie, father of Oliver and Teddy, who we heard earlier. Where is Teddy? He's gone. <laughs> 
They have been worshiping, worshiping with us for about over three years and officially joined about three years ago. And please welcome Ben as he shares his story. That's better. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, the uh, nursery service that the church provides for me and Deborah has been fantastic. Uh, Oliver's already a very sociable kid, so any chance that we have to give him the opportunity to interact with kids his own age is really a blessing. And him and Henry are just true pals. If you ever see them run around the nursery together, it's it's <laughs> it's pretty wild sometimes. But they're they're good boys. And with Teddy. What you guys have to realize is that he's very much a pandemic baby. He hasn't been to a lot of different places, and he isn't really around a lot of people that aren't family. And he's not away from Deborah and I for very long, more so Deborah because she works at home than me, but those stretches aren't very long at all. So for Teddy to go to the nursery and kind of just sit and kind of watch, and okay, Big Brother's having a good time. This Henry kid seems pretty cool. Well, maybe this isn't such a bad place really kind of helps him ease into situations that aren't our house or the grandma's house or wherever and just get him used to different people. And then for Deborah and I, you know, <laughs> at a different time and really a different world now, when the church had two services, we were early risers and Oliver was, for the most part, the mascot of the 830 service. And while he wasn't disruptive, he could be distracting and certainly distracting for us. So we're trying to keep him occupied so he's not bothering everybody else. And the service was just background noise at that point. So while we were physically at church, we never really felt like we were like attending or involved. So now they have the opportunity to leave the, the knuckleheads in the nursery. Really gives Deb and I a chance to just to sit and relax and reflect and actually enjoy the service and feel like we're involved. So in short, it's, it's been a blessing. And for your, those of you guys here that have little ones or everybody at home that has kids, Bring them along, it's, it's a good time. And Oliver made it a point for me to say that Miss Sue has the best snacks. So <laughs> that's it. Thank you all. Thank you, Ben. And it is uh, the, your generosity that allows us to have Miss Sue in the nursery to help parents have a, have a place to come leave their kids be, be separated for a bit, know that they're in a safe space, not very far away. But also know that you can bring them to worship too. Crying babies, don't bother me. You know, it's just part of life. So this morning, we will receive the one great hour of sharing offering. It's one of four special offerings received by the United Church of Christ, and the outreach team shares this video that tells us more. So take a look. Why is love the greatest? Because love is action. Love is resilient. Love is compassionate. Love digs deeper goes further, reaches higher. Love gives and then gives some more. Love is big and love is small. One Great Hour of Sharing has been putting our love in action all around the world and right here at home for over 70 years by responding to disasters, feeding the hungry, digging wells for those who lack water, building for those who need shelter, caring for the sick, empowering the marginalized, and equipping those who are ready to change their world in the name of love, God's love. Because when all is said and done, it's love that remains. Put love into action. Give to one great hour of sharing. Your generous gifts to this offering today will help our denomination make a difference in the sustainability of life here in the U.S. and around the world. We ask you to please give generously. And now please stand and join us in our closing hymn, 
Amazing Grace. Number 547 in the black hymnal. As you leave this place, may you be awestruck by the beauty of this world. May you laugh and may it be contagious. May you overflow with love for those around you. May you be effusive with hope and quick to point out joy. And in all your living and breathing and being, may you find yourself full to the brim with God's Holy Spirit and may it change your life. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Go in peace, full to the brim. Amen.